Okay. Welcome to the. Uh, yes, just to make sure that I'm not muted. Welcome to the Indonesia Projects COVID-19 webinar series. My name is Arianto Patunru, hosting this program with Nur Kemala Mulyani and Ruth Niki Julu. We acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians and pay our respect to the elders past and present. We are grateful for the support from the Australian National University and also the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. In today's webinar, we'll talk about uh, discourses and the dilemma surrounding COVID-19 vaccines in Indonesia. We have two distinguished returning guests, Dr. Ines Atmo Sukarto and Dr. E. Nyoman Sutarsa. Ines is a scientist at the John Curtin School of Medical Research at ANU and also uh, the CEO of Lipotech, a biotech company. She will discuss about various vaccines technologies and their differences in efficacy. Newman is with the Rural Clinical School of ANU College of Health and Medicine. He's also a lecturer at the Universitas Udayana. And he'll examine the preparedness of Indonesia's public health system with regards to vaccinations. And as usual, we will have Q&A session after the talks. But if you want, you can write your question anytime on the Q&A box, not on the chat box. We'll attend to them in the Q&A session. Please also kindly feel a little polling when it appears on your screen. We need this to improve our series. Um, for the first presentation, let me invite uh, Mbak Ines to kick off uh, her material and maybe share her screen. So, silakan Mbak Ines. Thank you very much. And thank you again for having me again. Uh, in this seminar series. As I said, it's not very often that um, you get a biomedical scientist presenting um, in this series. And, and um, I have enjoyed um, the interaction and, and because it actually makes me think about things um, outside of you know, the, the scope of the petri dish or the lab. Um, so if I just go to... Okay, so um, in this talk, I'm going to touch on like a, a few things um, and start with a pandemic update and look at the vaccine development process and approval. Um, I'll go through the list of the various vaccines that have received WHO uh, emergency use licenses and evaluation and compare different products because I'm sure that everybody's been reading about all the different vaccines that are out there and, and wonders maybe about the differences between all these different vaccine products. Um, I'll touch a little bit on efficacy versus effectiveness um, and I'll probably just like touch lightly on the vaccine rollout issues and the notion of variants again because I think this has been, um, uh, been prominent in the media um, in the last few months um, and I'll end my, my presentation with a little bit of um, um, views about the notion of politics and, and nationalism in vaccine development, which um, I think is quite relevant to Indonesia. So I was last presenting in this forum um, in May last year, and, and at that time, I think we had just gone the first wave um, we've gone through the first wave, witnessed the first wave in Italy and, and, and the US was, was um, kind of like on its way down from this first wave. Indonesia had a few cases and it was still going up um, and Singapore had also uh, gone through its, its first wave. Um, so we are now nine, ten months since then. Um, and we can see that um, the US has experienced many waves and the, the last one being quite um, significant. And, and the total number of cases is now um, in the hundreds of millions uh, with over half a million people um, dying of, of COVID in the US alone and more than two and a half million people um, dying globally. So that is, COVID is now a, a serious cause of, um, uh, of death from a infectious disease um, uh, in, in the last 12 months. Um, we can see that um, uh, Indonesia masih naik naik ke puncak gunung, so it's it's still um, going and rising. We really haven't experienced um, a first, second, or third waves. It seems to be going up, um, and and I will probably also put a note here that 
Uh, this recent downtrend that we have seen in the last week should be taken with a little bit of cautious, uh, because from what I hear from people on the grounds in the Puskas mass uh, that are actually involved in doing the testing, um, there has been some issues with uploading the data uh, from these tests from the various, uh, from the various uh, places that are conducting the test. So although it looks like Indonesia is going down, I would probably take that um, cautiously. Um, so in the last year, what have we know that we, there's definitely, a, we've, we've learned a lot of things. It, it's been, um, for someone in my field, it's been kind of a crazy, amazing year. Um, we, we've definitely learned a lot about the virus. There's been thousands of papers now published around the virus, the disease. Um, and, and I think um, I always stop and reflect on the fact that this tiny little organism that is less than 100 nanometers um, and only has 30 base pairs. So the genetic material that, that encodes this organism is so simple compared with our, you know, our 30 billion base pairs that a human has. Yet this tiny organism has really brought the world to a standstill. Um, so it really, uh, the virus has really uh, highlighted uh, the weaknesses in, in how humans um, uh, live, interact, conduct, um, conduct day-to-day -day activities. So that we, what do we know? We know that the disease is viral based. We know that it is disproportionately affecting the elderly and those with comorbidities. We know that they actually spread through aerosols despite the, despite the fact that there's a lot of theater around wiping everything down, um, including at this university. I mean, we know that the main mode of spread is, is aerosol, aerosol based, and we know that therefore ventilation is critical. We know that certain settings are critical in spreading the disease. So this creates those super spreader events and they tend to be settings that are enclosed um, in closed um, uh, venues. Uh, we also know that there's no silver bullet, there's no drug that has been, despite efforts to screen uh, all drugs and repurpose them and testing new drugs, no drug has really uh, proven to be a silver bullet. So all hope now lies in these vaccines. Uh, we've also learned, despite what Donald Trump's been telling everybody, that hydroxychloroquine does not work. Uh, we also know that bleach does not work. So we all know that vitamins are not the silver bullet, so that there's a lot of um, knowledge out there. And because vaccines are really now seen as, as a way out of these, um, uh, as one way out of this, uh, this pandemic, then there's a lot of attention on it. So I thought that we'll spend a few slides trying to kind of crash course here on a, the various vaccine um, technologies. So vaccines have traditionally been made by weakening or killing viruses, right? So most vaccines that you and I have received as children have been this soup of dead viruses or weakened viruses. So in this case, uh, the, vac the viruses are, are cultured or are grown like to thousands of liters of them um, through biotechnology uh, approaches, and then they're killed using uh, a chemical reaction, um, and then that's injected. So that's, you know, most vaccines are, are made this way, and that is essentially what what the Sinovac vaccine is. So the vaccine that's being used primarily at the moment in Indonesia is one of these traditional vaccines. They have worked, they have limitations, um, they need specific facilities uh, to produce them. Um, uh, but uh, they, they do make up a significant portfolio of the world's uh, vaccine products. What we have seen is this amazing um, progress uh, around these mRNA vaccines. And these, I mean, people like me have been very excited about it because mRNA vaccines have been developed over the last 15 years. So please don't think that in 10 months we have invented this new vaccine. This is really, you know, the, the pinnacle of, of 15 years of, of research, both in universities and in industry. But because of all that, they were able to, companies like Pfizer and BioNTech um, and Moderna were able to crash or well, fast forward the development um, of this mRNA vaccine. So this ones, these vaccines are very simple. They encode just the material 
um, that uh, makes or, or dictates how um, the spike protein of the virus is made um, and that's injected into your muscle and it tricks your muscle cells into making that viral antigen, that viral protein. Your body then sees it as something foreign and then it mounts an immune response. Now, why are we excited about this? It's because you can make a lot of vaccine very cheaply, very quickly using this um, uh, approach. So, Traditionally, you know, to make a vaccine, it's actually a very long process. I know it's, it's, it, you've got to be very patient when you work in this field. Uh, generally, you have years of, of work in the preclinical space. Uh, you then do a small phase one study, about 20 to 50 people, just to make sure that whatever you've developed is safe. You then move on and do a phase two study where you're trying to make sure that the product that you've developed works. Uh, and if you pass this, this um, phase, um, then you move on to phase three, where you, which is where you actually test the efficacy. Make sure that it, it is actually in doing what it's supposed to do in a large number of, of, of people. These phase three studies uh, can, are generally done in tens of thousands of people um, and they, they blind. So the people that give the vaccine and the people that receive don't know what they're receiving uh, to make sure that you're not biased by what you think uh, uh, you've re uh, received. Um, following on from that, obviously, then you go through uh, the registration. So your all the information that's been generated in all three phases and at the preclinical stage is reviewed by is reviewed by the FDA or, or the uh, EMEA or Baden Pom in Indonesia, um, and then you're authorized to use it. So these processes normally take ten years, right, to go from preclinical development to something that gets registered is usually 10 to 15 years. Um, and a lot of work has to go on in the in optimizing the manufacturing aspect of it. The rate of attrition is generally very big. Um, you start with lots of candidates and then you end up with, uh, with one. What we have seen during the pandemic is something very different, right? So at the top here, I have the traditional development of a vaccine, which I have said um, can take up to 15 years because everything is done sequentially, one thing after the other. Usually in between each phases, you have to raise the money to be able to do the work. So everything takes time. For to speed up the, the development of vaccines in a pandemic, because you know the, the vaccine is 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 really needed. Um, a lot of these steps have been done uh, in parallel. So we started. You're allowed to start a phase two before you have the results of the phase one, just based on the interim result of a phase one. Similarly, you can start your phase three uh, based on the interim result of a phase two. So things have been compressed so that a vaccine can be developed in in you know ten months to to a year and a half and this is what we've witnessed essentially we now have at least four vaccines that have received approval from the FDA um, so there's a number of vaccine platforms that have been used to develop vaccines for COVID-19 as I said from the traditional inactivated your your Sinovac your Sinopharm vaccine uh, to the viral based vaccine so these ones are the Johnson and Johnson and the AstraZeneca to the fancy new RNA vaccine, which are the Pfizer and, um, and Moderna, and to the relatively more advanced, but, but not as advanced as the mRNA, which are the protein-based one, which like Novavax. So Indonesia, interestingly, has secured access to one representative from each category. Um, and this is like from a number of candidates. There's literally hundreds of candidate vaccines uh, in development, but as I said, only uh, only a, a few have actually received approval. Now, looking at efficacy, and I think maybe like everybody else in the world, everybody has now knows that uh, different vaccines have got different efficacies. The mRNA vaccines have uh, shown very high efficacy, like in the 90s. Um, while the AstraZeneca one and, and the Sinovac one uh, have uh, efficacy between 65 and 70%. So what does it mean? Like the, the vaccine efficacy is really what we measure in a clinical trial. So it's something that, that we measure in under very controlled and optimal condition, I will have to say, uh, in a group of selected people. So we ex in generally the trials exclude 
people that um, uh, will be deemed to 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 uh, model the the analysis. So you, you generally put very healthy people in your clinical trial. So this is kind of like best case scenario. And in a vaccine to measure your efficacy and essentially what you look at is to look at the number of people that will develop the disease um, um, during the trial, right? So you have like in Indonesia, 1,600 uh, people divided into two groups, uh, 800 got the vaccine and 800 got the placebo. At the end of the trial or at the time point that's been selected, you look at how many people developed uh, COVID-19. In that case, there were 25. And out of these 25, seven of them had received the vaccine and 18 had received the placebo. So essentially, the, the, the efficacy is, is really a measure of uh, how well the vaccine reduces the risk of, of developing uh, the disease uh, in the vaccinated group. Now, what I have to also highlight is that in none of the clinical trials that have been done, uh, none of these trials are actually uh, designed to measure um, these, the, to measure or to determine or to show that the vaccine stops transmission. So what we can definitely tell from these clinical trials is that all the vaccines uh, reduce uh, the uh, the number of people that develop se uh, severe disease, but the trials were not designed to confirm that they actually uh, stop transmission, and and that can have some implications. Now, in 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 the real world, what you will see and and what uh, and what the various authorities will continue to monitor is the effectiveness. So the effectiveness of the vaccine is really how well does the vaccine work in the real world, right? Where things are not ideal, where different types of people will be uh, vaccinated, uh, where you know the eligibility for vaccination is less stringent. Although in Indonesia initially, uh, the people that were allowed to be vaccinated uh, were very stringently selected, but after some discussion um, the, with the um, health ministry, they, they, seem, they seem to be revising uh, and making the uh, eligibility for vaccination a bit less stringent. Um, so uh, how, let's have a look at, at um, these uh, COVID-19 vac vaccines um, and, and uh, what are the various statuses. Um, the, the winner in, of the race uh, has been Pfizer. Uh, it was first to get approval from the F, uh, from the FDA. So Pfizer is, has now been used in the US and the UK um, and, and in Israel. And, and a lot of very interesting data is coming out of Israel that actually you know, shows that uh, the vaccine is, uh, has very high effectiveness in, in normal population. And, and there's indication that um, although it wasn't tested in a clinical trial, the vaccine actually also stops transmission. Um, AstraZeneca uh, has also uh, now uh, been um, uh, approved, um, and essentially, you know, the, the, the vaccine that I have received approval um, are Pfizer and AstraZeneca, Moderna. Uh, now, the vaccines that have been produced by the Chinese companies, interestingly, have yet to, re to um, receive uh, WHO um, uh, approval. So that, that's something that uh, I hope the companies are working with the WHO uh, on that. No. On that. Uh, Novavax, which is a vaccine that both Australia and Indonesia are set to, to have also ordered, uh, have put some pre-orders. Um, I think that vaccine is in the late stages of its uh, phase three trials. Um, the data looks good from, from what we've been seeing in, in, the, in the media, so hopefully this vaccine will also soon be added to the list uh, of uh, arsenal vaccine arsenal that we have. Um, how does the coronavirus vaccine compare? Well, I mean, if we say, if we look at the AstraZeneca one to 70%, uh, compared with, for example, what is a normal flu vaccine, 44%. So I think, you know, when people say, I don't want to receive the AstraZeneca va vaccine because it only has 70% uh, uh, effectiveness, well, you know, compare that to the flu vaccine. 
um, here again, I wanted to highlight how quickly the development of these vaccines uh, has been. It's, it's completely unprecedented uh, compared with uh, what we've seen with uh, other products that are now uh, used uh, routinely. Um, so uh, again, uh, aside from uh, what the different types of uh, platforms are used to make vaccines, um, and, and something that they also will affect how the vaccines can effectively be rolled out is, is what temperature um, they need to be stored in because the Pfizer vaccines, I think uh, everybody's quite aware, uh, uh, need um, quite cold temperatures to be stored. And, and that can be uh, a challenge in, in, in places with where infrastructure is, is uh, not available. Now, we do have a number of vaccines that uh, appear to work, uh, would have been confirmed to work, uh, and that's good news. Uh, some of the a number of countries have started their rollout, uh, including Indonesia, which started in uh, mid-January. That's also very good news. Uh, but I think like everybody else, uh, uh, I've really been um, uh, a little bit alarmed or a bit worried about some of the news that we hear about the appearance of these variants. So the variants are the same, the same um, SARS-CoV-2 virus, but um, which have developed mutations uh, in certain parts of their um, of uh, of the structure, which in some cases can can render the 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 vaccines less. Um, less effective. Uh, and we have seen that in the news uh, from South Africa, where the South African variant, uh, after a number of tests, uh, was shown to, to, not, uh, to not be uh, protected uh, the, 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 by the uh, AstraZeneca. Uh, vaccine. And we also have seen that some of the uh, mRNA vaccines also have lower efficacy uh, against some of these variants. So um, these variants will always continue to appear. So the more spread of the uh, disease you have, the more likelihood you have of, of variants ha happening because viruses always mutate, right? So if you have hundreds of millions of cases out in the world, the chances of variants have uh, uh, occurring uh, is is really high. So, um, so we are now in a race between the vaccination and um, the um, and the spread of these um, of these variants. I'm sure that everybody is well aware that uh, different countries and different regions have been trying to secure access to to various um, uh, to various products. Um, with the US, um, the EU, and the UK securing a big portion of the first vaccines that that rolled out the production line, um, and we can say that uh, the US has secured a large proportion of the Moderna vaccine. They've also secured a big proportion of the Pfizer. Uh, of the Pfizer vaccines. And I think uh, you will also have seen um, the news where uh, the UK and the EU had um, a little bit of squirm over uh, the um, over the supply of AstraZeneca vaccine, which was produced in a European uh, uh, manufacturing uh, capacity, but was um, sent mostly to the to the UK. So um, there's a lot of very interesting um, uh, things happening around the vaccines. Who would have known, really? Um, Vaccine rollout. So this is um, from uh, I think this is as recent as a couple of days ago. Over 200 million doses of vaccines uh, have been administered worldwide. Reminding, keeping in mind that uh, for most of the vaccines out there, everybody needs two doses. Um, so that's really um, only 100 million people being covered. Um, mo um, most of these, um, a lot of these, uh, a big proportion of these vaccines have been administered in Asia, uh, which is probably made up by China and the, um, and the Sinovac and the Sinopharm vaccine, which have been rolled out in a little bit of a different, uh, a different way uh, to the rest of the world. And, and we we'll look at, um, uh, other than that, um, it, North America really uh, is the next um, place where most of these vaccines have been rolled out, and that's really mostly uh, the US. Now, if we look at the proportion of uh, in a given country, the proportion of the population that has been vaccinated, Israel obviously uh, wins the race, um, as it's now covered um, 
80% of, of its population followed by the United uh, Arab um, Arab Emirates. I mean, this is not, um, uh, you know, this is not surprising considering that these are small countries. Indonesia, I'm not going to go too far but, uh, into that, but Indonesia has secured, uh, my understanding is, access to now four different vaccines, uh, as well as access through the COVAX uh, facility. We can discuss later what COVAX is. Um, but um, as I said, it's, it's tried to hedge its bet by covering a number of different technologies. But I mean, in, in all uh, truthfulness, truthfulness, most of the vaccines that are going to be used in Indonesia come from the Sinovac. Um, stockpile. Now, an interesting thing that we are seeing now in the discourse in Indonesia is this vaccine, which was vaccine mandiri, and it's now vaccine gotong royong, which is essentially, um, you know, a, a pay to access scheme that the government uh, is trying to to implement uh, after some pressure from uh, from industry uh, to try, and this is really to try and speed up uh, the process. And I guess we can discuss that a little bit later. Um, Australia has started rolling out its own vaccines and it's doing that through some pri uh, priority kind of access scheme. Um, we saw uh, Prime Minister Scott Morrison get his, um, get his shot on Sunday. Not quite sure how he fits in phase A, 1A, but let's not discuss that. Um, he's really not a healthcare worker or quarantine worker. I suppose he is a priority worker. Um, so this is like 1.4 million people will be vaccinated in that first phase. Um, and then it's gonna move to the elderly and the immunocompromised. Uh, so it's it's really the, the how the different target populations have been selected are based on uh, how, um, these populations are at risk. The higher the risk of the population, the earlier they are going to be uh, vaccinated. Um, so uh, Australia's vaccine stockpile is mostly made up of AstraZeneca and Pfizer, and I think Novavax when that comes off the uh, of the line. Um, there is obviously a question of equity, both at the national level, how different priority groups are determined within a single within a country. Uh, who, you know, how do you determine that this? people should go ahead of other people. Uh, as I said, it's based on risk, but what people perceive as risk is different in different countries. Like for example, in Indonesia yesterday, I've seen that people working in the pasar in the um, in the markets have already started to be vaccinated, right? You, you're not seeing that like for example, uh, here uh, in Australia. Uh, in the US, there's been a lot of discussion about you know, how black Americans have been, um, uh, have not been making part, of the, making up the same percentage of the vaccinated population uh, in America. So they, they, they uh, disproportionately uh, affected. Uh, and at the international level, obviously it's, you know, the differences between the countries that have been able to quickly secure access to the vaccine compares to those that didn't and that will rely on the COVAX scheme. Now, vaccines have never been so politicized as today, you know, Boris Johnson yesterday I was listening to the news, you know, it's calling it the invisible shield and, you know, it's going to allow us to travel down the way to freedom. It's great to see vaccines, you know, being discussed in these like very, very poetic terms, but, um, uh, and it's because, you know, when we see these countries having such issues at controlling the disease uh, in, the, in the country, uh, the, vac the vaccines offer, I guess, uh, a glimmer of hope, but, um, I, uh, but I think people like me have been trying to, to try, uh, been trying to put that discourse into into some perspective because it will take time. It will take a lot of time before enough, you know, enough people are, are vaccinated to to really be, uh, to to really feel freedom again. Um, uh, the Indian vaccine manufacturer, um, which supplies a big portion of, of uh, the AstraZeneca vaccines, for example, uh, has also been under a lot of pressure by its own government to, to not export so much of the products and, and keep it in, inside. Um, and I guess, you know, like just uh, on the actual vaccination, you know, day one of the vaccination, we've seen uh, leaders using these as, as photo opportunities. And, and I guess you guys can judge who wore it better. Did, did, um, did Jokowi do a better job than, than, than Scott Morrison? Uh, 
at the, his photo op uh, of, the, um, of the first day of um, vaccination. Now, this is, I think, my last slide, um, and, and it's something that is, is actually quite interesting to me because, uh, it, and it's very, very um, uh, specific to Indonesia. We've, uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen this glorification of science and vaccines, and I guess that's what I say, that's glorification of vaccine. Um, and and it's, it's really started because of a lot of news that have uh, come out um, driven, by, um, uh, driven by the ex- Minister of Health and in some of these um, and some of the statement that he's made around this new vaccine called vaccine Nusantara. So the vaccines in, in Indonesia all have very nationalistic name. You have vaccine Nusantara and vaccine Merah Puti. So that, that really tells you a lot about how vaccines are viewed there. Um, and and there are one made a lot of claims about this vaccine, which by the way is still just in phase one, right? I mean, if you remember the long road to getting a vaccine out there, um, but that one made a lot of claims about this vaccine that it will, you know, give you long life antibodies. Well, you can't really know that because the clinical trial only started a couple of months ago. Um, and and I and, and a few colleagues have actually raised some issues around the, just the technology that, that he's claiming to use. He's, this program uses a very complicated cell-based personalized vaccine approach, which has absolutely no, 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 no role to play uh, in a pandemic uh, where what you need is, is simple and robust vaccines that can be rolled out quickly without too much technology. But it's really interesting to see because it's paint two groups. Um, you have uh, even the PR now kind of like taking the side of the vaccine Nusantara and, and of course scientists like me and, and Edie trying to, you know, uh, trying to actually explain that, that um, this is really false hope uh, and that we should really uh, discuss this uh, with, you know, within the, the scientific parameters. Um, so it is definitely interesting times. Um, I think it's good to see the vaccines being rolled out in Indonesia. There's definitely been lots of prob uh, problems, but I think uh, the next speaker will uh, will explain to us the challenges of, of rolling out a vaccine in a country like, um, uh, like Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mbak Ines. Uh, with that, let's go uh, straight through to uh, Abli Nyoman on the preparedness of uh, Indonesian public health system with regards to the vaccination. So, Bli Nyoman, silakan. Uh, you are on mute. You're still on mute, okay, good. Uh, can you see the screen, uh, Arian? Yes, yes. Okay. Let me make it full screen. Hopefully it works. Yeah. Mm. Is that the correct one? No, not yet. Yeah, now it's good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Indonesian uh, Project, really for having me again for the second time in this uh, series. Uh, in this uh, series. So, uh, and also thank you for Mbak Ines to set the, the scene really for my uh, discussion uh, for today. So we have listened earlier about uh, multiple uh, or various vaccine candidates and some of them have been approved by uh, WHO for the emergency use. And some uh, shown a very promising result and uh, some even uh, claim to be uh, effective in, in, in preventing transmission, like the one we see in Israel. And, um, but also we're now observing more and more countries try to secure more dose for their own people. So which is lead to what uh, Ma Ines was saying earlier about vaccine nationalisms. So I think that's also part of uh, my discussion a bit later. But in, in, in this particular talk, I'll probably mainly uh, be looking at the um, challenges uh, from Indonesian perspective, especially looking at uh, some issues regarding the health system, as well as demand uh, generation, 
and some uh, potentially trades off trades off uh, that we need uh, uh, to compromise in uh, rolling out uh, this uh, mass vaccination program in Indonesian context. So um, when we talk about uh, overcoming pandemic or pandemic control, especially with this uh, new era where we planning to roll out a mass vaccination program, we may as well talk about war. So when we talk about war, we listen a lot or we, we, we tell us a lot about uh, personal uh, courage or as well as personal leadership. And, um, and in many cases, uh, the war might be won by those that have logistic. They get the, 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 the supplies uh, timely and in insufficient numbers. And similar situation or similar, similar analogy can be made for uh, uh, pandemic uh, situation, especially with the vaccine rollout. We see many stories about the government initiatives and we see a lot of government's leadership in controlling the pandemics. Uh, but saving lives in pandemic situations uh, require uh, logistic. And in the current regime in particular, we need appropriate and timely supply uh, for the vaccine so that the people can get vaccination earlier rather than uh, later. So um, in, in saying this, uh, this is not country by country war. So we actually in war together. So if we want to win this, 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 this pandemic, we have to work together. So. Um, but Ines already, already talked a little bit about uh, the, the current pandemic or the current uh, epidemiology of COVID-19 in Indonesia. I just would like to bring it uh, forward again, some issues regarding uh, our current pandemic. So we haven't seen any uh, declining trend yet. So since March 2020 until now, we actually um, still in the first phase. So we haven't seen any declining uh, trend over the last 12 months. And um, the overall uh, cases until now, not until now, until 21st of February, it's around 1.2 million. And the case fatality rate remains one among the highest 2.7%. And uh, if we're looking at specifically in the last week or the average uh, new cases in the last uh, weeks or seven days, it's actually quite high in terms of numbers. So around 8,700 uh, new cases per day. But bear in mind that our uh, testing capacity is still very uh, limited as well. So um, as per yesterday, it's only 38 uh, per 1,000 uh, population. But the positive rate remains uh, really high, so which is uh, close to 19%. But when, when looking at this positivity rate, so we need to consider that the, the current testing regime in Indonesia are very uh, strict. So most of the, the testing are for those uh, who are in close contact as well as those that are presenting with uh, symptoms. And in the last few uh, weeks, we also see a uh, difficulty in, in, uh, in, in putting that the data. So we have some issues with uh, recording uh, and reporting as well. And uh, Indonesian government has uh, implemented many initiatives uh, uh, to control the pandemic. Some of those include uh, PSBB or social movement restriction and also uh, 3M or triple M or triple T initiatives. Uh, and now we entering a new phase in, in controlling the pandemic, which is uh, the vaccine era. So let's have a look at this uh, picture. This is actually a political statement from Indonesian uh, president, uh, Jokowi, uh, regarding uh, the vaccination program. So uh, she, uh, Jokowi received the first dose, uh, I think it's on the 13th of uh, January uh, last month. And uh, it marked the political imperative for vaccination program in Indonesia. So uh, until now, uh, I think Indonesian government already uh, secured almost, um, not secure, not get the vaccine yet, but has a deal with, with with four main uh, company, and that's probably account for 400 million doses for uh, 181 uh, million Indonesian population eligible for the vaccination program. But uh, despite the good political will to achieve this common good and to reduce especially the mortality and hospitalization because of the COVID-19, we've seen a numbers of clear challenges ahead in relation to the rolling out of this uh, vaccine. So uh, if we're looking at this uh, graphic over here or this data over here, so up until 22nd of February, only 1.2 uh, 
vaccine, um, the first dose of uh, Sinovac vaccine has been uh, administered and only 764,000 completed this, uh, the second dose. So it is very uh, slow uh, if, if we're looking at uh, the, the ambitious target of the Indonesian government. And uh, if we're looking at the, the Indonesian government uh, roadmap for the vaccination, this is actually the, the, the initial roadmap. So it will be divided into two phase, phase one and phase two, or wave one and wave two. And um, by the end of April uh, 2021, it was planned uh, to vaccinate all health workers, 1.3 million, and also public workers, which is 17.4 uh, million. And just recently, elderly population also included in the in the in the uh, wave uh, one uh, has been uh, approved, and uh, with the total number around 22 million, 21.5 million. So in total, in the first wave, Indonesian government tried to vaccinate close to 40 million uh, population. But if you're looking at the the current coverage, uh, these numbers seem very very ambitious. And in the next phase, the Indonesian government tried to roll out uh, additional 64 million for vulnerable population and another 77 million for uh, the rest of the population, depending on the supply of the, of the vaccines. So while this plan, I think it's workable uh, on, on paper, but it is uh, indeed very ambitious uh, target uh, for Indonesian government to complete the vaccination program by the end of 2022 March. And whether it's attainable or not, so we, we, I think we have to wait and see the, the progress that we make in, in, in the next few months. So then these estimation came up. So we see that uh, the uh, Bloomberg uh, John Hopkins uh, University estimate uh, Indonesia will need more than 10 years to, to cover 75% of their population. So this uh, estimation is actually um, based on assumption that the average doses per day is around 60,000 uh, doses. But there is some issues with this estimation. So the first one that we need to consider the, the, the goal of the, Indonesia, uh, the, the vaccination in, in Indonesia, whether that's to achieve herd immunity or uh, to, to reduce the case and to flattening the, flattening the curve. So we need to, we need to uh, consider the vaccination program in Indonesia. Achieving uh, herd immunity is essentially a long-term goal. Yes, we, we all want herd immunity where more than 70% of the population uh, have the immunity against uh, COVID-19. But we also need to consider more immediate goals for the uh, vaccines uh, rollout in Indonesia. For example, to flattening the curve, um, to allow more space in the hospital, to reduce mortality, or to reduce severe cases that require hospitalization. That's uh, also a tenable goal. And one uh, estimation conducted by UI, so uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, suggested 40% is enough to, to reduce the uh, reproduction rate into uh, lower than 1.0. It means that we will start see declining of the cases uh, that require hospitalization uh, if we can cover 40% 40, 40 of the Indonesian population. And uh, the best uh, strategy proposed by this team is to concentrate on high density population and high prevalent areas to, to achieve uh, this target. And the second limitation of the previous estimation is uh, they use a linear assumption so in, in mass uh, vaccination program, there is an acceleration programs often uh, taking place. So we need to take this into account when we do uh, the uh, estimation data. But despite all of that limitation, one thing that very clear from this uh, coverage data is that we deal with very low coverage since uh, January 2021. So in, these, uh, in the next few slides, I'm probably gonna to touch what might be the challenges in rolling out this vaccination program. So um, to simplify the thinking, I will try to classify the issues into three broad uh, categories, so supply side and then health system, as well as the demand uh, side. So uh, global supply, so I think um, Ines already touched uh, a lot uh, and discussed a lot about uh, the global supply. And uh, the challenges for, for the global as well as for the national uh, country is the production and manufacturing capacity at the global level are very limited. So we need to acknowledge that to be able to cover the whole population, 70% of the whole population takes a time for, for the manufacturer to produce uh, enough vaccine. 
And also we're dealing with the global and uh, global governance and distribution issues, as well as uh, vaccine nationalisms that can uh, impede the, uh, the, the coverage of the uh, vaccine for the uh, low and middle income countries. Um, these four a key dimension of the global vaccination challenges are actually interrelated uh, one to another. So uh, say, for example, the development and production mechanism will uh, influence the, the, the pricing as well as the affordability of, of vaccines globally. Uh, and then that will also inf influence the allocation and deplo deployment of the vaccine into the communities. But what Indonesian government has uh, been doing uh, is quite uh, promising actually. So there is a political and uh, financial commitment. So uh, 21.8 trillion uh, Indonesian rupiah has been allocated by the Indonesian government to secure around from 426 million doses uh, for 181 million Indonesian population. So uh, deal uh, have been made with uh, five uh, vaccine candidates. So Sinovac, um, uh, which is the, uh, the, 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 the currently available vaccine in Indonesia. And also uh, with Novavax, uh, Sinopharm and AstraZeneca. And Indonesia also part of the uh, COVAX uh, Gefi Alliance uh, to, to be able to uh, procure uh, another vaccine. And with the local manufacturer and development, so vaccine Meraputi is uh, under underway and currently being uh, developed uh, in, in the lab. And I'm not talking about vaccine Nusantara because my Ines already talked about vaccine Nusantara. So we probably can discuss vaccine Nusantara a little bit uh, uh, later in the discussion. So this is uh, some of the comparisons so within Sinovac, Novavax, uh, uh, AstraZeneca and Sinopharm, for example. So the efficacy are very uh, varied from 50% to 91%. Uh, but as, you, as we can see, uh, the deal has been made with the, with the high income countries. With Sinovac, for example, 18% has been secured by the uh, high income countries. And uh, AstraZeneca is even higher, 27% has been uh, ordered by the high income countries. Pfizer is, is extremely um, uh, anomaly, 77% has been secured by the high income countries. So it will be a global inequity in terms of the availability of the vaccine. And this is something that we need to, well, not we, but a global community has to deal with how to secure or ensure the equitable access to the, the vaccine. And uh, rolling out a mass vaccination program in a pandemic situation requires complex uh, vaccination systems uh, that will uh, rely uh, heavily on the health system capacity and its interconnected subsystem. For example, what we need in Indonesia uh, is accurate register of the population. So to, to, to selectively uh, invite people to participate in the vaccination program. We also need effective supply chain and distribution uh, system which is uh, very difficult uh, um, in, in, in mass vaccination program. We also need a health workforce in sufficient number as well as uh, effective uh, reporting and surveillance uh, system. And also as the case of many vaccination program in Indonesia, health system context plays significant uh, role in the success of vaccination uh, rollout. For example, rejection of many groups uh, and also we encounter um, uh, many uh, hesitancy in, in regard to uptake, uh, the vaccine uptake, demographic situation, the total numbers of Indonesian population are quite uh, large. And we also dealing with uh, geographical context, uh, infrastructure in general, as well as uh, technological context. So this is the comparison of the uh, advantages, relative advantages and its disadvantages of, of Indonesian context. So in terms of the advantages, we're quite fortunate because Indonesia relatively uh, considered as, as a young population. And uh, there is also a strong political imperative from the national government to support the, the rollout. And financial commitment are very clear and the national gov government already uh, secure uh, financial support. And uh, in terms of the past experience, Indonesia experiences uh, 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 in implementing compulsory vaccination program through uh, primary care. And that's one of the uh, relative advantages uh, from Indonesian perspective. And we have existing community health workers and community system for health programs. So that's a relatively uh, advantages for Indonesia. But we also have a numbers of disadvantages, large population. So we have more than 270 millions, and it means that we need to cover at least one 
181 million population uh, in Indonesia. Proportion of elderly, uh, even though it's, it's, it's a relatively young population, but we still have a significant uh, numbers of elderly, which is more than 21 million. We also have geographical uh, uh, challenges and existing inequities in access to, to health. A complex supply chain system for especially for vertically implemented program like uh, this mass uh, vaccination program, health decentralization and uh, competing local priorities. That's also relative disadvantages uh, from Indonesian perspective and also premature uh, pandemic preparedness to mobilize uh, community. So we just uh, start to recognize that we need uh, such system to be, uh, to be put in place in a time of crisis. So, but we're still in early stage of that uh, phase. So there is also some health workforce uh, challenges uh, to roll out a mass vaccination program. So the number of trained health workers uh, in Indonesia to solely uh, focus on vaccination are very limited. So the current strategy is to utilize existing health workers and uh, we need to uh, take into account the additional uh, burden uh, that, uh, that will be carried by the existing health workers so as a trade-offs. That's also something that we need to take into account. And for uh, isolated area or hard to access uh, areas, so we will have uh, quite si significant issues in relation to transporting the staff as well as transporting the vaccines. So um, one key um, alternative that might be worthwhile to explore is to deploy community health workers that inherently uh, attach to the village level in Indonesia. Also, we can use health cutters, for example, or we have a numbers of medical student or interns that can be uh, deployed to support the implementation of the uh, uh, vaccination program. And we also have a numbers of logistical infrastructure and distribution issues. So at the moment, we also, uh, we see a, a numbers of storing and distributing uh, capacity from national, local and community levels. So uh, they, are, uh, uh, they have their own challenges in relation to storing and distributing uh, the vaccines. And difficult to reach population uh, and cold chain system also need to be uh, reconsidered. And because uh, this is a nationally coordinated program, we need to deal with the multi-level health governance uh, in Indonesia from national governance. And then we have provincial level, district level up to the uh, village level. So that, that need to be uh, taken into account. And uh, not, to measure, not to mention that uh, vaccine uh, procurement is actually a very complex procurement system. So not, it's not as easy as, as it looks like, but in, in reality, it can be very, very challenging. So uh, the other the, the issues that we need to, to, to explore further is to simplify the supply chain management system. So this is probably uh, a warranted uh, further discussion later on. And a provision and information system. So this is actually one of the most key challenges in Indonesia at the moment. So whether we wanting to implement uh, the vaccination program as a facility base or outreach uh, model or combined model. So we need to, to think about uh, how we will roll out the vaccine to increase the coverage. Scheduling, uh, uh, scheduling uh, challenges from identification eligible uh, participant, invite them to, to, to come to the uh, health center and then give them the vaccine and recall for the second dose. It seems simple uh, on paper, but on reality, it's very, very challenging uh, to, to, to implement. And prioritization strategy and risk classification is proven to be very uh, difficult uh, in Indonesian context. So if we, if we learn from the Israel experience, for example, they use very simple uh, risk stratification. So you, they use only age uh, as, a, as a primary uh, marker, which, which one need to be uh, vaccinated first and which one need to be vaccinated second. But to take into account all of the risk dimension, it can be very difficult. We also will encounter burden from reporting and recording uh, as well as post-vaccination surveillance. So that's something that we need to think, uh, think about as well along the line when we're rolling out uh, more and more vaccination uh, towards the population. And uh, the other key issues that I would like to touch is the demand generation in Indonesian context. So uh, at the moment, we, we, we encounter a numbers of, uh, of uh, sentiment and anti-vaccine movements, uh, not just in Indonesia, but, but across the globe, there is actually a, a numbers of movement, uh, anti-vaccine movement. 
vaccine hesitancy is quite high in Indonesia. More than 30% uh, of Indonesian population are hesitant to take the vaccine. And trust and risk communication remain the issues, not just now, but it's actually an ongoing issues during the pandemic with the risk communication strategy. And also we start uh, trying to find a, a, a uh, an effective strategy to community par participation and community mobilization. So um, this is uh, some issues that has been proposed by Indonesia. So Jakarta tried to introduce fine approach uh, for the uh, non-takers, uh, non, non, non as well as Indonesian government also uh, tried to approach the program through a punitive approach. Uh, in my opinion, punitive approach will generate resistance from many uh, population groups and, and also uh, in nature is a, it's a discriminatory policy. So to effectively generate uh, demand and community participation, we need a different approach rather than a punitive uh, strategy. So in principle, uh, what we actually need as a, as a collective, uh, collective uh, uh, collective uh, identities, uh, transparent and effective risk communication. So that's uh, the main thing that we, we need to, 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 to reach the population with the correct information and, 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 and uh, make them realize that uh, effective vaccine will not mean that the virus will go away. So we will bring it under control and to reduce mortality and hospitalization. So we also need a, a more appropriate prioritization and risk assessment strategy. So we need to have a clearly defined and specific prioritization, prioritization uh, strategy. And public dialogue and community engagement are very uh, encouraged. And also prom promoting trust for common good is also encouraged. So some of the actionable action that we can uh, do. So the first one that I think um, will be very useful is linking prioritization and risk assessment with different delivery system or provisions. Say for example, health workers, um, ED for example, uh, can, can, can do uh, the risk assessment and then the, 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 the identification of the eligible uh, participant can, can, be, can be conducted by ED for example. Similarly, in the, in the uh, community level, for example, they can identify the elderly population uh, at the community level and then uh, also uh, those that require a uh, vaccination program early on rather than later on. So we need to link uh, this prioritization and risk assessment strategy with different delivery system or provisions. So uh, we need to leverage the key strength of the Indonesian health system. So we need to leverage primary health care model that we have, also the community health center and community health workers to deliver vaccination in coordination with a form community system that, that already form or organically in the, in the community. So we also need to complementing the current online booking system. So online booking system is great, but we need to uh, complement the system with traditional community system to identify uh, eligible uh, individuals uh, from, from the grassroots uh, community. And uh, the last actionable items, uh, implementing population-based or population-wide strategy to address social and economic disincentive uh, to vaccination uptake. For example, local uh, distribution through community health center that can be promoted. And uh, it can also link uh, with uh, health posts. Um, they can open in the morning and in the evening, uh, as well as uh, during uh, the weekend. So that's, that's some, some, some ideas that can be explored uh, when we start the, the massive rolling out of the uh, vaccination program. So uh, some trade-offs. So um, Ines already touched about the global uh, equity and in inequity of the uh, COVID supply. So in relation to uh, COVID nationalism, so that might create inequitable distribution and eventually create access inequity to vaccination and perhaps pre preventable uh, death as well. So the other thing that I would like to uh, emphasize is uh, globally, there is an increasing emphasis on global health security. Uh, with the emergence of the of the pandemic as well as the vaccination program, what does it mean for the for the uh, global uh, society is that the shift in the global aid landscapes towards uh, emerging infectious diseases, and it will create opportunity costs for non communicable diseases and other neglected tropical diseases, which is remain the major causes of deaths for many people in uh, low and middle income countries. So this is something that we need to think about globally. Uh, what this vaccination regime means uh, globally for, for, for other country as well. And uh, nationally and locally, so we need to, to think about uh, difficult to access areas. 
So uh, supply and distribution to reach difficult to access areas. So that's might be the trade-off uh, when we're rolling out this vaccination because we tend to concentrate on high density population to start with. And uh, prioritization, prioritization and risk assessment, it's, it's very difficult to take into account all dimension of risk. So some uh, compromise has to be made. And also we need to take into account the existing and equitable access to healthcare, health facilities and uh, general infrastructure across Indonesia. And uh, another trade-offs, so uh, health resources are finite. So that's something that we need to, to keep in mind. So when we are rolling out this vaccination, so compromising of other sectors or programs has to be made. So, so we're just to making sure that it's not bring negative consequences to, to the population when, when vaccine uh, uh, COVID-19 is uh, rolling out. So we are tend to moving away from structural intervention toward biomedical intervention. So that's also something that we need to consider. So uh, we don't want to see that the structural intervention stop when we have vaccination programs. So it has to go hand in hand to be able to uh, win the race with the pandemic. And along with the biomedical model and the vaccination program, health system strengthening and community system strengthening uh, should also be uh, uh, strengthened. So we don't want the vaccination program uh, jeopardize the existing health system strengthening and community health system strengthening that already in place in Indonesia. So as I, uh, uh, to conclude, so vaccine 19 vaccination program must be placed within the broader pandemic control strategies. So this include enhan enhancing uh, tracing, testing and treatment, also along with the health system strengthening initiative, uh, alongside with the community system strengthening and other structural determinants intervention that lead to health inequities in the first place. So I might stop there, uh, Pa Arianto, and uh, to give a bit of time for uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Bli Nyoman. Uh, now let's move to Q&A session. We have more than 80 participants. Um, for the first round, uh, I'll invite uh, Andre Surianta, Raisa Anisa, Terry Hall, and Titi Anas. So maybe we'll start with Andre. Uh, thank you, Pa. So, uh, very interesting talk, and uh, it's a personal interest of mine as well because I'm also following the vaccination program. Uh, actually, uh, I have a question I, I posted in the Q&A. And I'm actually asking by Ines, are other countries do you, that you know of are targeting vaccination for the whole population or just 70% like Indonesia? Because I actually think that the 70% is probably an illusion number. We shouldn't just vaccinate 70%. So maybe you can answer that if you don't mind. <laughs> Great question. I, I've been asking the same question, actually. Um, I mean, 70%, if you remember the beginning of the pandemic, there's been a lot of discourse around herd immunity. And if 70%, you know, we need to, to, to get 70% of the population um, to be immune to reach herd immunity. I mean, these numbers are quite academic, to be, to be honest. But also what we have to realize is with a lower efficacy vaccine, we actually should be covering more of the population, right? Because um, if you have a vaccine that's only 60 or 70 percent efficacious, uh, then you know vaccinating just 70 percent of the, the the population won't get you to that number. Um, to, to, to herd immunity for sure. So whenever you, you mix vaccines, you, you know, you, you obviously by mixing it with the Pfizer that it increases a, a little bit, but, but still, I agree 70% is kind of a, a number that I think the government chose to, 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 to some degree reduce the amount of vaccines that they have to, to purchase because it's easier to say, well, we'll cover just 70% of the population. Um, but um, I don't think that other countries are using, you know, I haven't seen other countries um, using the same, the same number approach. We should be trying to vaccinate everyone that actually um, qualifies for vaccination. Okay, thank you. And just a little bit like, uh, just a little bit of shameless plug of my own research, basically. My interest is because we're seeing different provinces might finish in different times, right? And, you know, 
a lot of the people has, I think the WHO is talking about inequity becoming a problem as well. And I think if we don't vaccinate everyone, then the provinces might be at risk of infecting the rest of the 30% from other provinces if we don't vaccinate everyone. So that, that's sort of like where I come from. I think we need to vaccinate everyone instead of just 70%. So yeah, completely agree. Completely agree. And I, and I know that a number of civic society organizations are also raising the issues and that's been disco discussed, um, including with you know with with the health minister uh, and, and people from the health department. So I don't know whether we're going to see a change. Um, th maybe this is where Vaccine Mandiri could, could come in and play a role, but that's, that's a like, completely different topic of discussion. Great. Uh, let's call Raisa now. Raisa? Yeah. Um, thank you, Varianto, for the opportunity. Uh, my question is regarding the vaccine mandiri that uh, Ibu Ines just mentioned earlier. Um, I'd like to know uh, what is your opinion on this uh, current vaccine gotong royong policy in Indonesia? Um, do you think uh, by involving the private sector, it can really accelerate the herd immunity? Um, but how about the risk on the profit taking or commercialization of the vaccine? And if, if you may know, uh, are there any best practice on this case uh, by involving private sector to uh, can be involving in the vaccine action policy and or maybe in the past uh, global disease by involving uh, private sector to uh, accelerate the vaccination program itself? Uh, thank you. Yeah, great question. That, that, that is another cave of mine to, to, to to say like this vaccine mandiri or gotong royong. Um, I think uh, I think a lot of people know that I'm not really a big fan of the um, of the approach. Definitely not the way it has been um, explained at the moment. So at the moment, uh, the limitations or, or the general the general I guess generally how the program is is proposed to work is that. Um, the vaccines that will be included in vaccine mandiri will not be the same as the vaccine uh, gratis. So there'll be different ones. Um, the, the vaccine will be still purchased through uh, the women and, and, and that's to, to ensure that um, the quality and it's purchased from reliable supplier, I guess. Um, but at the moment, uh, there's some issues. There's a few issues. First of all, I think um, vaccine mandiri should not even be discussed uh, until we have uh, vaccinated the most, um, the population that is most at risk, right? So until these, you know, the healthcare workers, the elderly, um, whoever is in that uh, second phase is not, has not been vaccinated, then vaccine gotong royong um, should, is, is really not a good idea because it will divert divert um, resources, essentially. Um, so I have been involved in a number of discussions, some of them quite heated, that included also uh, people from their women and, and people from um, Gemenkes. And, and, and they had assured us uh, that vaccine mandiri will not start until June or July. Yet the news yesterday was saying that um, the Sinopharm vaccine, which actually, by the way, I think is now going to be part of the vaccine mandiri, not the vaccine gratis, the Sinopharm vaccine had arrived in Indonesia. So, you know, despite the fact that the, the night before we had, you know, had been assured that this is not going to start until June. So there's a lot of mixed messages. And, and what I was trying to say if, as part of my previous answer is that maybe a way that the private sector could actually um, be involved is in actually helping to cover that extra 30% of the population that is not covered by the government, right? So I don't think it's fair that whatever vaccine mandiri uh, covers is included in whatever the government has set as its target, right? That should be a completely different target, uh, I think. So th there is scope for involvement by the private company. By all means, I think the government needs all the help that it does. It it's trying to do the right thing. I think the new minister is trying to implement uh, things in a much better way. Uh, but um, I think we, we must keep things in 
try to, to not uh, complicate things. So maybe helping the distribution, helping the storage. We know that they, uh, they've had issues with the storage, with access to freezers and things like that. There's so many other ways that the private sector could help rather than just purchasing uh, the vaccine. But if they do want to purchase the vaccine, then by all means, purchase the extra 30% that are needed. Um, that will actually help uh, increase coverage in Indonesia. Um, yeah. Thank That's you, great. Marines. Uh, maybe for the interest, in the interest of time, we'll take uh, both Pak Terry and Pak Titi uh, before we respond. So Pak Terry, can you go first? Yes, thank you very okay, much. But... A great presentation on, on both speakers. Uh, I have uh, two sets of questions or two questions. Uh, the first question, uh, is about the vaccine Nusantara as a, um, a problem of politics uh, that is getting bigger and how to, how to cut it off. Um, because with the very powerful influence of a lot of nationalists who are supporting Dr. Terawan, uh, we are seeing a lot of people being confused uh, both about the type of vaccine, and we need to know a lot more about what this vaccine is in order to either uh, promote it or uh, stop it in its tracks. Um, the second question is about the outreach program where I would look to the childhood vaccination programs, which involve the BKKBN and the POSYANDU and uh, those kinds of outreach. If a vaccine is appropriate for um, mass distribution out in remote areas, uh, do you see a role for the BKKBN and the POSYANDU and uh, how would that be organized? Thank you very much. Thank you, Pa Terry, maybe uh, Pak Titi. All right, thank you, Acho. I think this is a very uh, useful um, uh, uh, webinar uh, on vaccination that is very relevant to Indonesia. I have uh, two, uh, one question from Mbak Ines and uh, one for Pak Sutasa. Mbak Ines, uh, good uh, to see you uh, finally. I've been uh, heard about you uh, for quite some time. So Mbak Ines, on the excitement of vaccination in Indonesia and the efficacy, uh, um, this uh, leads uh, to um, some concern uh, for me uh, because uh, uh, before we reach herd immunity, those who uh, are vaccinated already might uh, also get still get uh, infect, infection and if they don't observe a 3M, they might spread the, uh, the, the, the virus to others. So uh, I'd like to reconfirm this uh, to you uh, because uh, do you, do you, you, you are the expert. I've checked with the doctors. I, I see, uh, I, I mean, I uh, learned the, the, the same uh, concern uh, that I uh, have about uh, this efficacy and uh, the uh, possibility that people don't observe 3M after they get vaccination, which probably going to be dangerous uh, to uh, our effort to reduce the infection. Uh, am I correct on that? Uh, to Pak Sutarsa, on the community system to, uh, for vaccination, uh, if you heard that the Indonesia has uh, implemented PPKM Micro, where the surveillance of COVID are um, uh, carried out at the smallest uh, governance cluster uh, level, uh, say for example, RT, RW, dan uh, village. Uh, how do you see we if we integrate the vaccination uh, to this uh, PPKM Micro, uh, given that uh, uh, employing all the resources up to the, 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 the micro levels. Uh, as you know, prob probably the Puskesmas, we don't have it. We don't have them 
for each of the desa uh, or RT RW. So it will be very difficult to uh, mobilize people to go to the uh, puskesmas to get vaccination. Rather than that, we probably better to employ all the resources that we have at the uh, uh, smallest level of uh, um, uh, government in, in, in uh, either desa or kelurahan. Thank you very much, Acho. Thank you, Mbak Titi. Maybe Bli Nyoman and then Mbak Ines. Um, uh, yeah, uh, terima kasih, uh, Pak Hul and Mbak Titi. Uh, so yeah, so uh, my uh, position in relation to how to best rolling out a uh, vaccination program is facility-based vaccination program won't be sufficient to, to, to cover the whole population. So we need different approach. So we need different model. So um, facility-based uh, approach uh, will still be an uh, ongoing program. So people can go to hospital, people can go to community health center to get vaccinated, but we need to increase and enhance our community okay. outreach. So as suggested by uh, Pak Terry, so uh, one, of the, one of the body that can be um, uh, strengthen their role in the vaccination is BKKBN. Yes, absolute, absolutely right. And we're looking at the risk stratification. So BKKBN probably can concentrate on um, young couple or uh, pregnant women or maybe uh, mothers. So that's probably the primary target for uh, BKKBN. So uh, definitely. So we need to include as many uh, bodies as possible within this program to be able to uh, reach uh, more population. The benefit of the BKKBN because they also have uh, uh, continuing uh, midwifery in their program, so they actually are trained uh, health workforce in that sense. So uh, that can also be leveraged to to improve the the, the coverage. Yes, but Terry, so uh, completely agree with 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 the outreach using existing bodies such as uh, BKKBN, and also uh, with the community system. Yeah, the PPKM uh, Micro is, is actually one of the uh, one of the uh, key that we have, so they can work together with the village cadre, for example, and uh, that's also include uh, Poshandu at the village level if they're still active. So in the some in in some uh, city area, Poshandu is no longer uh, active. So, but in some village where they still have Poshandu and they can communicate one to another, where the vaccine can be supplied by the local community uh, health center. So. Um, the, the more grassroots uh, outreach that we can do, I think that's actually uh, the better. So because uh, that will reduce the disparity. So that also will reduce the potential um, uh, underprivileged for people who don't have access to digital platform. So using grassroots uh, outreach program is actually um, will uh, boost the coverage of the program. So it learned from the past experience. So using this uh, community system, uh, uh, in coordination with the community health center actually work really well in, in Indonesian context, looking at from the compulsory vaccination program or other vaccination program, HPV vaccination program, for example. So this sort of uh, model actually work effectively. So we can try this model to boost the, the coverage of the uh, COVID-19 vaccination program. Thanks, um, bye Ines. Okay, let's tackle the vaccine Nusantara topic first. Kind <laughs> of my existence for the last couple of weeks. Um, that I one should definitely not get a Nobel Prize for that. I'll I'll start with that answer. Um, so I, I agree with Pateri. Um, th this vaccine Nusantara is actually uh, polemical discussion. Is actually quite confusing, right? Um, and I think it, it is part of this glorification of science. In that science will. You know, because nothing else seems to work, science will, will provide the answer. And it seems to be in Indonesia, we also think that the more complicated the science is, uh, the better the outcome. Um, and this is a great example because vaccine Nusantara is actually based on an approach that's been around for 20 years, actually. And it's, it's, it's an approach that's been used to, to try and develop cancer vaccines. So just quickly, what it, what it does is it takes your blood and out of this blood, they try to get the immune cells. And in the Petri dish, they will expose the immune cells to the vaccine antigen, combine them with some very expensive components, and then 
freeze them at minus 80 degrees and then try and put them back into you. And what I have been trying to say in the public domain, including in the, in the media in the last two weeks, is that we actually don't need it to be this complicated because we actually have proof that the, very, that the vaccines that we have now that you just inject in your arms work very well. So if someone can actually show me the rationale for using this very complicated approach, um, then, you know, for, you know, be it, but there's no reason for using this vaccine Usantara approach. And um, the other thing is that uh, despite the fact that it is called Nusantara, everything about this vaccine comes from an American company. Every component of it comes from an American company. And based what on what I can see in the clinical trial databases, even the formal sponsor for the phase one clinical trial is the actual um, American company. So if someone can explain to me how Nusantara that is, that would be great. Um, and I guess I'll just say that, but I, I, I agree. The, the, this whole discourse is actually confusing and it's actually been used by um by other people and it's actually taken up a lot of my time um, and it's making me a little bit worried as well um but but did he, that was like um, a very good question as well um oh i don't know whether i hope you have heard good things um about me um should i be worried um anyway i agree with you i mean and i think your concern is a concern that i have also tried to voice um in through various uh, various ways including the media i think we need to explain to people that until the majority of the population has been vaccinated we are not safe so just because you got your vaccine this morning please don't do what rafi ahmad did and go to a party in the evening right so with the rollout of the vaccine campaign needs to come a, a communication and education campaign as well. And I think it, it probably hasn't, there's, there's not enough of it and there's a lot of confusing in, information out there, although I know people are trying to, 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 to do their bit. Um, so yes, you are right. Um, as I was trying to, to say in the presentation, the clinical trials don't show that or don't confirm um, or because then we haven't tested um, that the vaccines stop the infection, right? The vaccines definitely reduce the number of severe, severely ill people, but we don't know that if you get vaccinated um, and you don't show, you might not show symptoms, but you might still be infected and we don't know that you might not be able to transmit it. There's a lot of unknowns in the pandemic because everything happens so fast. So I think the, the message that needs to come out there is even though you've been vaccinated, you still need to implement 3M, your masks and, and, and all that. Yes, I agree. Thank you, uh, Newman and Ines. Uh, we have uh, seven minutes left, so I'll take Helena Suisa and Hal Hill. Um, Helena? Thank you, uh, Mas Arianto. Hi, my Ines, uh, Tarsa. Thank you for your presentation. It's a very great presentation from my Ines and Blis Tarsa. I have a question for Blis Tarsa regarding the challenge in vaccination program in Indonesia. We know that uh, Jakarta at least imposed uh, the penalty um, for those who refuse uh, to be vaccinated. So uh, I was wondering if you have any data or insight if there is a specific issue regarding this information or misperception in Indonesian community about the vaccination itself that potentially be a challenge to the program and also for both Mbak Ines and uh, Blisutarsa. Uh, again, about vaccine Nusantara, and uh, we know that uh, the role of uh, scientists in Indonesia, at least uh, during the pandemic, um, we have a, a very big question on how uh, the government involves scientists uh, in handling a pandemic in Indonesia. So I would like to ask for your opinion or observation on how, uh, what is the role of scientists uh, in Indonesia right now in handling pandemic? Uh, do you think the government should uh, involve them more? Because I think now the challenge for the, the, the scientists is, uh, is they have to face 
the authorities, like officials, for example, Pak Doni Munardo, I think a week or two weeks ago, saying that the pandemic will be over by the 17th of August in our Independence Day, something like that. Like, and that's, I think, like only one of the example of how uh, the scientists have to work on the, 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 the claims made by the authorities. Thank you. Thank you, Helena. Uh, Hal? Uh, th th thanks very much, Acho, and thanks to you and Nook and Ruth for uh, another great webinar series coming up this year. Uh, Ines and Newman, thanks very much for your presentations. I had two quick questions which have already been partly answered. First one is, when do you think it will be possible to sort of resume relatively normal travel in Indonesia, you know, thinking in particular of your tourists, business people, students and so on, to be able to move around reasonably safely. And secondly, uh, has the new health minister appointment, Pak Sadiqin, already made a difference, uh, not just in the rhetoric, but also in the policy implementation? Thank you. Thank you, Hahil. Um... But Ines, can you, we go to you first? Um, and how have scientists been involved and in, oh, how should they? I mean, scientists were definitely not very much involved, I think, formally. And I think it, it, whether that was last year or, or even after Bob Boudet has, has, um, has come on board, at least not formally. Um, I'll, I'll disclose, I have had several informal meetings with, with people from governments and, and giving them my advice and they can do whatever they want with it um, but all of that has been very informal I mean I think a very clear role for the scientists is is kind of to I mean to you know to drive the discourse to drive a healthy skeptic discourse um, uh, about what is happening and whether or not uh, you know whether or not the the implementations of the of what Indonesia the Indonesian government is doing, uh, how you know we view that. So I mean, that's kind of the way that that scientists have been working. Um, I know I'm part of several groups, and and we try to raise attention to certain issues when we think uh, that um, they need attention, and we do that through the media, and and, and eventually that means that you know we get. To, to talk to people in government, but whatever they do with, you know, with this information, it's really up to them. The, the biggest problem is that we are always then viewed as being anti-government because inevitably what we do is criticize, right? Um, so that makes it quite, quite a difficult game to play. Um, uh, I just quickly, I'll just address what uh, how he had. When do we think it'll be possible to travel to Indonesia? It's really difficult to know until we know a little bit more about the level of protections that the vaccines that we will get here in Australia afford. So I think you know it will be a while, definitely not this year. Um, like you, I would very much like to go to Indonesia, but I, I, I definitely think you know it will be another 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 year if we if we're lucky and and Pabudi personally has made some difference um, at least he is actually trying to engage in discussion um, when things have been raised he has um, gathered um, uh, people like myself and other scientists in in you know zoom forums to to seek input from us so at least it seems that he wants to understand uh, and get get a different view so definitely the first thing that he did on Christmas Eve was to gather a lot of paper from Kawal COVID pandemic talks and scientists and we all sat there like on these webinars and you know told him this is how we see the numbers right and um, it was quite interesting to see his reaction because you know that that, that wasn't what he was being given internally yeah Lee maybe you have something to add um yeah, so uh, I'll probably um, uh, answer a, a question from Helena regarding the uh, situation in Jakarta and the uh, penalty approach. So like as I, I said in the presentation, uh, I'm not a big fan of the uh, penalty approach. So I don't think so. It's, it, it will generate enough demand. So what will, what will happen with the penalty or the punitive approach is actually resistance from the community. So we need to move away from that approach. So in saying that, so we need to find out more 
effective demand generation strategy for uh, for Indonesian. So, say for example, so what we what we've seen is uh, influencer, for example, for Indonesian society. It might it might be something that we 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 can think about. So, but in in this context, uh, I uh, strongly. Um, encouraged to improve our risk communication strategy. So we see that we failed during the early phase of the pandemic for the risk communication. We don't want to see that happen again in the rolling out of the vaccines. So I think that's it's a big uh, task and a big homework for Indonesian government and all of us really to, to try to identify a best risk communication strategy to, to, to at least to reduce the hesitancy from, from the community to take up uh, the vaccine. So we know that evidence show the vaccine is safe. So there is enough evidence out there that the efficacy is actually quite high. So we need to communicate this effectively to the uh, community. And unfortunately, I don't have the breakdown of the coverage per region at the moment. So I have the, the lumped data about the coverage as well as the hesitancy, but it would be great to if we are able to access the coverage data per region and then we can see where actually the gaps are but we don't uh, i personally don't have that data at the moment and also just uh, to put how when we can travel safe to indonesia yeah my Ines already mentioned <laughs> I, we don't know even after the vaccine rolling out if indonesian population become complacent that's another issue as well so so uh, we can't really rely on on uh, vaccination rollout so as i mentioned earlier we need to put vaccination rollout in a broader uh, pandemic controls uh, of COVID-19 in general. So we can't uh, euphoric uh, for the vaccination and then forget that we actually need to do another control measures. Yep, uh, I think you. that's uh, Pa'arianto, some yeah. uh, additional thoughts. Yeah, thank you very much. I know we've hit 2.30, but if you don't mind, just one very quick question. Uh, I'll just read it from Richard Porsuk. And why do you think uh, the testing has been so inadequate? Maybe by Ines? <laughs> all difficult questions. Um, so in the testing, I think uh, we all have to realize the testing is actually quite a complicated method that is used for testing and, and requires trained personnel. Um, so that's one thing. So that's the technology. Um, initially, there were only a few numbers of labs that, that were actually able to do the tests. Um, and and um, and 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 also, it's it's not just being able to do the test; it's being able to transport the samples in a way that the integrity of the sample is actually adequate for the test. And and you can see that because in Indonesia's numbers, you, you see that the same person sometimes two or three samples need to be tested, and and I think that that that's an issue. Um, some of the numbers that we see now is not because the tests are not being conducted. It's, it's, it's part of the problem is that the reporting is, is an issue. So I know that people were saying when they want to log into the NAR system, uh, you know, they say, you know, putar, 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 they can't even log the data onto the system. So that's why the numbers are also quite misleading. And, and I think and just one last comment is, um, although uh, Blake was saying that, you know, the criteria for testing are quite regimented, that's for the free testing. But the problem in Indonesia, if you have the money and you want to get tested because you're going to have a party the next day, anyone that has the money can go and get tested. And that is actually adding to the burden of the people that are conducting the test. So this is where the commercialization of the of, of, of one aspect has actually not helped because people are people that shouldn't get tested are actually being tested and using the time that the scientists that are doing the test should be testing the people that you know are at the highest risk. So that, this is why commercialization needs to be done very carefully. All right. Thank you so much, um, Mbak Ines, uh, Blinyo Mansutarsa. I think it's been a wonderful discussion. I also would like to thank all the attendees, all the participants. And with that, uh, let me turn this over back to Nuka. Thank you, Ajo. Um, please join us again next week. Uh, we have another seminar scheduled by Santi Kusumaning Room from Puskapa. Maliki from Bapenas and Woro Sulistianingrum from Bapenas as well. The topic is uh, racing against time, 
the COVID-19 impacts on children and vulnerable individuals in Indonesia. All right. With this, I will close this webinar. Thank you.